In the last video, we reduced the two-body problem from a problem that had six degrees of freedom down to only a single degree of freedom that we needed to work with. And the Lagrangian for that two-body problem looked like this. When we reduced it down to one parameter, that parameter being r, And today we're going to finish solving uh, that problem now that we have this nice, easy to work with Lagrangian. And in solving this two body problem, uh, we can start exploring things like um, orbits and orbital mechanics. So the first thing that we want to do when we are uh, dealing with the Lagrangian is write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. So we need to take these two derivatives so the partial derivative with respect to r dot is mu r dot and then taking a time derivative of that gives us mu r double dot. Oh, And I guess before I start uh, this mu is the reduced mass of the system, so that's m1, m2 over m1 plus m2. And v effective as a function of r is the angular momentum squared over 2 mu r plus the potential. And this is just some generic potential that's a function of r. And when we do orbital mechanics, we'll plug in the specific potential that deals with that motion. And we had this definition for the angular momentum squared, which is mu squared r to the fourth theta dot squared. So getting back to our Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, this was one derivative we need. And now we need the partial derivative with respect to r, which would be the partial derivative with respect to r of the effective potential. And if we plug in what we have for the effective potential, we get something that looks like this. Now, normally we want to actually do this partial derivative with respect to R, uh, but in this specific problem, uh, there's a trick that we can use to not do that and that's gonna make our lives a bit easier. So instead, we're just going to write down our Euler-Lagrange equation, which equates those derivatives that we just took. Okay, so this is mu r double dot equals the partial derivative with respect to r of the effective potential, which is mu or L squared over two mu R plus V as a function of R. Okay. Now, the trick that we're going to use is that we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by R dot. Now I haven't, I've multiplied both sides of the equation by the same thing. 
So I haven't changed the value of this equation at all. And now uh, we're going to look at each of these sides separately. So we'll do this side first, and then we'll do this side second. And we'll start to see why we're doing that substitution. So we have this mu r double dot r dot. Something that you might recognize is that this is actually the total time derivative of mu r dot squared over two. And so just to check this, if we take the time derivative of this, we would get mu r dot, and then we have to take the derivative of r dot, which is r double dot. So this checks out. Okay, so this is the, the first thing, uh, the first term. And then the second term is this r dot times the partial derivative with respect to r of L squared over two mu r plus b is a function of r. Okay. What you might notice here is that this kind of looks like a um, chain rule. And so what I mean by that is if we were to take the total time derivative of L squared over two mu R plus V as a function of R. What we would get is, so we would want to take the time derivative of all of these terms. And when we do that, we would have to pull out the time derivative with respect to r from each of these terms. So when we want to check this, if we take the time derivative of the first term, nothing explicitly depends on t. So you might think that there's no, there's nothing to do here, but r is a function of t. So when we take this derivative, um, we have to take a derivative with respect to r, and then we have to do the chain rule to take the derivative of r with respect to t. And then same thing for the potential. There's no explicit t dependence in the potential. It only depends on r, but because r is a function of t, we have to do a chain rule of taking the derivative of r with respect to t. And so if you factor out the dr by dt, and then you see that both of these have a derivative with respect to r, you get the term that we started with. And then of course, dr by dt is just r dot. Okay, so now that we have simplified that a bit, the so we had an r dot that we just multiplied on both sides of our equation. So we started with this mu r double dot, r dot equals r dot times 
partial derivative of r with respect to, or yeah, partial derivative with respect to r of l squared over two mu r plus b as a function of r. And we were able to rewrite the left side as the total time derivative of mu r dot squared. And we were able to write the right-hand side as the total time derivative of L squared over two mu r plus b as a function of r. Now, because both of these are total time derivatives, we can group them together. Mu r dot squared over two plus L squared over two mu r plus b as a function of r equals zero. So now because we have a total derivative of some stuff and it equals zero, from Noether's theorem, that tells us that this is a conserved quantity. And so whatever this stuff inside of the time derivative is, has to be a constant. And this constant, because we're taking the derivative with respect to time, is going to be energy. So energy is mu r dot squared over two plus L squared over two mu r plus V as a function of r. So we've just shown that the system has conservation of energy. Now, if we replace the L squared term uh, with what we had defined it as earlier. So now we have energy equals one half mu r dot squared plus mu r. L squared over two R plus B as a function of R. Now, if we replace our L squared with its definition, then we get the following equation. Mu R squared theta dot squared over two plus V as a function of R. And so we went, we took our Lagrangian and reduced it down to one parameter so that we could do the Euler Lagrange equation. And we got a, an equation of motion from that Euler Lagrange equation. And now we're reintroducing our theta term so that we can describe the motion of the object as it's orbiting. So we have this equation now. <clears throat> and if we wanted to solve it for r as a function of time, we can isolate the r dot in this equation and it's going to equal plus or minus the square root of two over mu times the energy minus the potential as a function of par minus the <clears throat> angular momentum divided by two mu r squared. Or you can replace it with the mu the L squared with its definition up here. Okay, so now we have R dot, which is dr by dt. And that allows us to write this as dt equals dr divided by plus or minus the square root of two over mu e 
minus v as a function of r minus l squared over two mu r. Okay. Now we have something that if we took the integral of both sides, integrate to get t as a function of r, then invert it, then invert your equation to get r as a function of t. And now that we've expanded or reintroduced theta dot into our equation, we can also get theta as a function of t. So to do that, uh, so we want d theta. If we just multiply by dt by dt and dr by dr, we've just multiplied by one twice. But if we regroup this, so move the one of the dt's here and move one of the dt or and move the other dt to the dr. Now we've got theta dot one over r dot dr d theta equals theta dot over r dot dr. And also remember that, uh, so we have this definition for L, L, L equals mu r squared theta dot. And so theta dot equals L over mu r squared. So we can replace this theta dot with L over mu r squared over r dot dr. And remember that r dot we just found was square root of two over mu e minus p as a function of r minus l squared over two mu r. Plug that into here. And now we've got d theta equals L over R squared times dr divided by plus minus the square root of two mu. So it's not two over mu because this mu up here uh, is gonna be brought down to the denominator. And then e minus v as a function of R minus L squared over two mu r. Okay, so now we have a function uh, where if we took the integral of this, we would get, so integrate to get theta as a function of r and you can solve this uh, equation. Now, everything we've done so far has been general, so a general potential, uh, but now let's stick in a, a potential for say gravity. So, so far, Everything has been general.
let's use the potential for gravity. And so for gravity, V as a function of R is, so gravity is a one over R potential. And so we're just, I'm gonna call this K over R negative. And this K is just some constant. Uh, if you remember from Newtonian mechanics, this constant was G M1, M2. But we're not gonna, I just don't wanna write GM1, M2 over and over again. Okay, so if we take this potential and plug it into our equation for d theta, we get L over R squared dr over plus or minus the square root of two mu minus e minus, and I guess minus minus becomes plus k over r minus l squared over two mu r. Okay, now that we have a specific potential in our equation, uh, we can do this integral. The solution to that integral is theta equals cosine inverse of L squared over mu k r. minus one over the square root of one plus two e L squared over mu k squared. Which if you don't wanna deal with inverse cosines, you can just write cosine theta equals L squared over mu k r minus one. over square root of one plus two e l squared over mu k squared. Now we're gonna make some definitions up to make our life easier so we don't have to write a lot of stuff. Alpha, we're gonna define as L squared over mu k. And epsilon, we're gonna define as square root of one plus two e L squared over mu k squared. Okay, and so with those definitions, we can now write cosine theta equals alpha over r minus one over epsilon or doing some algebra, alpha over r equals one plus epsilon cosine theta. So this is the kind of the big punchline, the big final result of this. So this equation this is the equation for conic sections. And so what are conic sections? Uh, geometrically, if you take a cone and you were to uh, slice through the cone at different angles, you would get different conic sections. Those conic sections are, oops, 
hyperbolas. Parabolas, ellipses, and circles. And so just to draw what each of those looks like, we'll start with a circle. And then we'll draw an ellipse. And then we'll draw a parabola. And then a hyperbola. So this is hyperbola. And this corresponds to epsilon greater than one. This is the parabola, which corresponds to epsilon equal one equals one. This is the ellipse, which corresponds to epsilon equals uh, this corresponds to epsilon is either less than one or greater than zero. And this is the circle, which corresponds to epsilon equaling zero. And so this epsilon is the eccentricity And remember this epsilon was uh, had physical parameters connected to it. It was the square root of one plus two times the energy times the angular momentum squared over the reduced mass squared times the constant, which is related to uh, universal gravitation constant and the two masses of the system. So these are the four possible orbits that you can have in two body motion. So let's say that uh, we're talking about the sun, something like a parabolic or a hyperbolic orbit uh, are unbound orbits. So you could imagine a uh, say an asteroid from some other solar system uh, kind of whizzing through our solar system. It feels the sun's gravitational pull, uh, so it starts to kind of go around it, uh, but it's moving too fast and then it exits the solar system. Then for things that are bound in the solar system, uh, we're looking at elliptical orbits and for most of the planets, they, the elliptical orbits are, uh, the eccentricity is so small that they're very nearly circles. And so I'm talking about bound orbits or unbound orbits. And one way to see that directly is to look at an energy versus radius diagram. And if we plot the effective potential, it'll look something like this. So this is the effect. Maybe I'll do that in a different color. The effective potential will look something like this.
And so for those bound and unbound orbits that I was talking about, if you had an energy up here, you would be in an unbound orbit. Then if you had an energy down here, you would have in a bound orbit. And up here would be elliptical. Or if you look specifically at the bottom of the potential, you would also be in a bound orbit and this would be a circular orbit. And so starting from the two body problem, we were able to reduce our equation down to something that only depended on one parameter. Uh, then once we had that, we could set up our Euler-Lagrange equation. We ended up solving that slightly differently than we have in the past. Then once we had our Euler-Lagrange equation, we could solve for the our position as a function of time. Then we could reintroduce our angular position. We could solve that equation as a function of time. And uh, what we got were these different kinds of conic section orbits. And depending on the total energy of the system, you would either have hyperbolic, parabolic, elliptical, or circular orbits. And we could look at the graph of our effective potential and describe where on this effective potential map we would have unbound, bound, or circular orbits. So now that we've had a, an in-depth look at the two-body problem, now we're going to uh, look at the three-body problem. And what we're going to do with the three-body problem is use the background of the two-body problem and perturb the system by introducing a uh, mass much smaller than either of the two masses of the uh, orbiting bodies. So in the case of, say, the sun and the earth, those would kind of be the background system. And then we would introduce a, uh, a third mass, like a satellite. And inserting that third mass into this two-body problem, we can find uh, the Lagrange points. And the Lagrange points are equilibrium positions uh, within the rotating two-body system. And we'll see that in the next video. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Peep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.